10 years ago, when I first found the Instagram app, it was not appropriate to show your milk cow on Instagram. Nobody wanted to see that. But there I was milking my cow, pretend, you know, in the barn, doing it in secret. Nobody wants to know about your milk cow. And somewhere between then and now, I heard about Homesteaders of America. And I was like, I need to go there. Those are my people. They, they all gather at the same place. And I've never been here until this year. This is my first time at Homesteaders of America. And I have to say it is exactly what I dreamt it would be. Every booth is selling something that I'm interested in. <laughs> all the people, you don't have to keep your milk cow a secret. You all are my people. This is where I belong. This is my family. Oh, and like Ginger said, look down when you're flying over the Midwest. Here's what you'll see. When you start seeing perfect squares out the airplane window, you will know you're over Iowa. That's how organized we are. Everybody farms in squares. <laughs> the roads run. Okay, alphabetical roads. Where did Ginger go? Alphabetical roads go north and south. Number roads go east and west. Good to know. So if you're on an alphabetical road, and they all go like Quail, Rampart, Underwood, like that's how organized we are. Anyway, rabbit trail right off, of, right off the top of my head. So I am not a public speaker. Other than last year at Homesteaders of America Women's Conference, I have very, very little public speaking experience, and I always assume that people that are up here really love public speaking and they chose to be up here. I didn't realize that sometimes God tells them to get up and they go kicking and screaming the entire way. But now I know that not everybody loves public speaking. I'm one of those people. So, but if I can get you to laugh, that puts me at ease and then, then everything's good. I, the other thing English is not my primary language. I don't have a fancy education. And by that, I don't just mean I didn't go to college. I have an eighth grade education. And I'll explain all of this as we go, but I always feel like I have to give people background so they understand where I'm coming from. The other, so when, I feel sorry for the people that have to introduce me because I don't have a book to my name. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> I don't have a book to say, oh, she's the author of this book. Our farm does not even have a name. It's just simply our home. I, I don't have any of that. I have an Instagram following, but there's this meme that is going around, and so there, it's this comic, and there's this lady, and there's a guy hitting on her, and he says, uh, she tells him, oh, I am so popular on Instagram. You are, I'm so far out of your league. And you know what he says? Well, isn't that just kind of like monopoly money? <laughs> but seeing you guys in real life makes me realize you guys aren't just monopoly money. You're the real, you're the real deal. So I'm very happy to see all of your faces. So like Ginger said, Elvin and I have seven children. The oldest is 22 and about to make us grandparents for the very first time. The second is also a daughter. She's getting married in February. And then the other five, which you, if you are an Instagram follower, you see a lot of them on Instagram. So they range in age from almost 16 to seven years old. Those are the youngest five. And we live on 21 acres in Northeast Iowa. We have lived there for the last 22 years. So it's home to us. We have several milk cows, and the other day one of the kids comes in and they're like, Mom, did you know we have nine cows? And I'm like, no, it can't be right. So you know how they say chicken math? On our farm, we have cow math. <laughs> and I started thinking, we, like, we get buried under snow for four to five months out of the year. Do we really have nine cows? Because if that's the case, we gotta go buy more hay. 
but we we have two cows that we milk and then we have some beef cows our one cow had twin calves so that kind of multiplied really fast and we keep them in separate pastures that's why i wasn't aware of actually how many cows we have we have chickens and turkeys and ducks i'm not a bird person so i don't know how many of each of them we have i know some of your chickens have names our turkey has a name, his name is Romeo, like our, our Tom turkey. But other than that, I don't know how many chickens and turkeys and ducks we have. Uno has a name, that's right. So Uno, we tried to hatch turkeys. Uno was the only one that hatched. So that's why her name is Uno. But she now has babies, which we will harvest and put in the freezer. We have a breeding pair of heritage hogs. And if you know what, if you're familiar with pigs, that means we also have some that we're fattening. We're about to have another, you know, litter of piglets. So you never only have a breeding pair. You always have their offspring as well. We have a donkey. His name is, I knew there was Dave fans in here. We have some dogs and then stray cats, of course. We have a large garden that is my pride and joy and we grow everything we possibly can in our short growing season and then we preserve all of it and then of course processing the dairy from our two milk cows so that kind of get like that's what keeps me busy my husband Elvin works a full-time job and I say he's there for the heavy lifting like if I decide I think we need more hay he's on it if I need a new fence he's you know he does the heavy lifting so both my husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonites. Old Order Mennonite, a lot of people put all the Mennonites together in one category. The Old Order Mennonites are the most conservative of all the Mennonites. So they're very similar to the Amish. They drive horse and buggies, no media of any kind. You were considered very modern if you got the daily paper, which our family did. <laughs> so in 2007, when my husband and I got saved, we left the Mennonites or were excommunicated. And what that basically means is our life now looks like having a hand in each pot. We love the modern conveniences like our smartphones, fiber optic internet service, the best thing that ever happened, and of course driving cars not going back. <laughs> While on the other hand, we really, really like the slower paced life of our childhood and that of our ancestors. Um, we try to stay away from consumerism and materialism and just mainstream culture in general is we're very drawn to the simple life of the first 27 years of our life. So, the Mennonites and Amish have their own private schools, but it wasn't always that way. When my parents attended school, it was, it was all public school. So then, and I'm not sure what happened first. I'm not sure if the government passed a compulsory attendance law that required all students to go to school through high school. I'm not sure if that was always in place and then just caught up to the Amish and Mennonites or if that was a new law and then it, it started um, affecting the way they wanted to raise their children. So the Amish and Mennonites started keeping their children from public high school and middle school. They consequently were jailed for not sending their children to school. So this became a court case and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and they won the right to educate their children their way, like pr their private schools meaning they only went to 14 years old, which is about eighth grade. And this, my parents remember this happening. So this meant that they, uh, um, the Amish and Mennonites could write their own curriculum for their schools. They could have their own teachers, no government teachers, government licensed teachers, and, and what this did is it preserved their culture. Keeping their youth out of the, the public education system preserved their culture in a much 
for a much longer time. So now does it make sense when I say I don't have a fancy education? So they, they do the, the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic, and everything else is, you know, learned at home. So my husband and I both graduated at 14 years old, and I'm telling you all this, I'm getting into the meat of my topic, but I'm, I'm letting you know all of this so that you can understand the rest of the story. So as a 17 year old, guess what my job was? Teaching in a Mennonite one room schoolhouse, first through eighth grade, anywhere from 20 to 30 students, and teaching the basic subjects. So that was my job. I taught for three terms and I loved every minute of it. And I still, like time management skills, I credit that time as a teacher. All my time management <laughs> skills, I learned in that classroom as a teacher, because it took a lot of time management to get those subjects through first through eighth grade. So we got married and started our own family. And in the early 2000s, homeschooling in the Old Order Mennonite Church was not popular and not encouraged at all because everybody re was still old enough to remember their grandparents being jailed for, you know what happens when a generation doesn't remember the, the trials of the previous generation, it's not their choice, it wasn't their battle. So they're not as likely to, it doesn't carry as much value to them. And that's the generation I was. It wasn't my battle, I wanted to homeschool. I was just certain that I would be a better teacher for our then two young daughters than some other Mennonite girl would be. I wasn't wrong. <laughs> but we were strongly discouraged and, but what happened? And this is just like looking back, I can see this being the very beginning of this, of God's plan to get us out of where we were. We attended a homeschool conference. How many of you have been to a homeschool conference? Okay, so now imagine being a young Mennonite mom who's been very, very sheltered. Like I've not heard preaching or teaching other than in the Mennonite church, right? So I go to a homeschool conference. My world is, I'm just blown away. And for the first time in my life, I'm sitting under people that are teaching the gospel in English. Because all the, the, in the Old Order Mennonites, all their church services are in German and Pennsylvania Dutch. But so for the first time, I'm hearing the gospel in English and how it, how you can use the gospel in raising your family. And I was introduced to authors like Sally Clarkson, Charlotte Mason, and all her teaching. And this was the very, very beginning of our disentanglement from legalism. We didn't really know it at this time. Um, and so I got invited to a Charlotte Mason book study. And the lady that was <laughs> leading the book study, she talked about God as if she knew him personally. That was brand new to me. I'd never heard anybody speak like that. So long story short, my husband and I both got saved. We left the Mennonite church, and that's a story for another time. But that was the very beginning of where I am today. Disentanglement from legalism has been the hardest thing that we have ever, ever walked through, but God has God has been faithful. Um, there was relationships that were gone. And I say all of this, and I in no way want to hinder the work that God's doing to restore our relationship with the Mennonite community. So that's why I say that's a story for another, another day. We all know that we came out from that and we got disentangled. So we're 27 years old, we have two children, we have never thought for ourselves what to wear, where to go, when to buy and sell things, because those were all rules that we just followed as part of the community and the culture. So we've never had to choose those things for ourselves. 
And guys, you do not want to raise adult children that have been so sheltered by your family culture or your community culture that they don't know how to make God-honoring decisions. You do not want adults. You don't want to raise adults that don't know how to make God-honoring decisions. It's not a good place to be. Thankfully, my husband and I, we found Jesus first and then left the culture. So we always came back to, does this decision honor God?